All right, good evening, everyone. Welcome to First Bible Church on a Wednesday evening. Um, I'm going to need your help tonight. Uh, got a little allergies going on. You're going to hear a hoarse voice, but I'm going to try the best that I can. But thank God it says, make a joyful noise <laughs> unto the Lord. So if we can please stand and turn to page 352. Jesus, lover of my soul. Sometimes we don't sing it enough. But 236, amazing grace. And I'm so thankful for that grace that saved me.
Pastor? All right, let's take some announcements, do some announcements, and then we'll give it to in the season of prayer here. Uh, two clipboards in the back. Continue to pray for Scotland. Uh, good portion of the team should be back Friday sometime. Uh, Mike and Margaret, Pastor and Margaret, will uh, stay for an extra week over there. Keep uh, that uh, second week that they're over there is when we have our uh, September camp is coming up, up in Speculator. Keep that. It's always a fun time, a good time, spiritual time, and, and just a fun time that uh, our youth are involved uh, in our September camp. And uh, October 8th is uh, anniversary. Just keep that in prayer. And Andrew Soche will be with us uh, not only that Sunday, and he's coming in uh, the, the, uh, the, head, uh, the previous week, and, and that was, uh, he's uh, just a sweet elderly man who's uh, in, uh, pastored for about 25 years, and now is uh, an evangelist. So, uh, but we've come to love uh, Andrew Soche. Okay, what uh, Operation Jerusalem is on schedule for this Saturday again. So uh, if you can avail yourself to that breakfast, we'll get it into, uh, we're in the book of Galatians. I think we're up to chapter 5. So just uh, avail yourself to that if you can. It's always good attendance for that. What else, uh, what else is there? What else? Anything else to pray about tonight? Yes. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow's the wake. And, um... Richie Badlamente, uh, his brother-in-law passed away, and he has been asked to speak at the funeral at the wake. So that's uh, Thursday. Just keep uh, Richie. I I spoke with him. He has called uh, uh, Pastor Mike and Chris Perfetto. Called me today, just wondering uh, how to approach a uh, a funeral. And I told him I can remember doing the first time I did a funeral. Uh, I was a brand new Christian and uh, didn't know how to approach it. And uh, our founding pastor, uh, with his words of wisdom, just said, uh, preach Christ and preach to the living. All right. Uh, don't preach about the guy in the casket. You don't know where he's at, even under the best of circumstances. Uh, so preach Christ and preach to the living. And that's basically, we talked about other things. But just keep Richie uh, Badalamente in prayer. His, uh, Frank, uh, his, his brother-in-law's one uh, son asked, uh, spoke to him about uh, speaking. So just, uh, yeah, keep that in prayer. That's Thursday. The normal keep... Uh, our missionaries in prayer. If you get, uh, if you're on Telegram, which most of us are, uh, they're uh, they're having an exciting time uh, in uh, in Scotland. So uh, looking forward to uh, the whole team getting back, and Mike and uh, Margaret, Pastor and Margaret, getting back, and uh, just. Uh, but the pictures have been just uh, wonderful. Not only the work, uh, a lot of a lot of tracks have been. Uh, handed out, a lot of street preaching's been done, but uh, they're just enjoying this, the sights, enjoying seeing things, and enjoying each other. So just uh, just keep all that in prayer. Uh, keep Maurice and Jerda and uh, Paul and David, their boys, uh, in prayer. Once again, I don't have anything new on, on that, but uh, uh, Maurice stays the course and just continues to, to hand out the French Bibles. Uh, just uh, keep all that in prayer. All right, what else do we have today? Anything else? Yes, Kevin? Uh, Jonas and Ruth? Yes. Uh, 
I don't, we don't always say it from the pulpit here. Many times we do, but it's usually in a deacon's meeting or downstairs on a Sunday morning uh, as we pray. But uh, there's a faithful handful of folks. Uh, we only met uh, Ruth and Jonas Moses one time. It's often been told this story, but he's, uh, he's been in prison for a long time now. Uh, for, so f uh, what we can determine were false accusations. And, uh, but his wife, uh, there's a handful of God's people. We don't do it corporately as a body. But uh, I think the last uh, time every Thursday or, uh, or once a month on Thursday, we, we send out uh, monies, uh, checks to our missionaries. And I think the last time it was almost $900 that was sent to uh, uh, Ruth Moses. And, uh, and they're always very faithful in uh, thanking us for that money. Uh, once again, this is not a corporate thing uh, that we do. Uh, there's just a handful of God's people who just uh, have kept her uh, financially in their, in their minds and in their hearts. So just keep Jonas and Ruth Moses uh, in prayer. What else? Anybody else? Anything else? Uh, yes. Ellen, Ellen Say it again. Ellen Burns. Ellen Burns. Yes. Got difficult for you. <coughs> Ellen Burns. Emil's friend. She's on the respirator. Okay, respirator. All right. Uh, Steve? Um, I think the Bible says pray for the peace of your city. And with more, um, whatever you call the immigrants, whatever name you give them, they're here. There's more coming. Most of them have nothing to do all day long. And um, I'm personally asking the Lord, give me wisdom how to relate. I meet these and um, but pray for the peace of our city as well. Yes. Yes. Uh, regardless of what we what political uh, position you take, uh, something we always need to remind ourselves. Uh, Jesus Christ, by the Father's will, was birthed into the most totalitarian society on the face of the earth at that time. That was the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire wasn't a sweet, I mean, it was a dictatorship, okay. Uh, the emperor, the Roman Empire, the Caesar, uh, he was worshiped as God, all right. And the Jews would come to a point where they would say, we have no king but Caesar, you see, all right. So, but we often complain about our nation and once again, whatever position you take, uh, I'm not commanded to complain about my nation. Now, there may be things to complain about, but if I read my Bible correctly, and I know I do, you get into the book of Romans, and Paul tells me to pray for those in authority. Pray for them. All right? Now, that may seem like a hopeless exercise. <laughs> But it's not a hope. We're commanded to do that. I'm not commanded to complain. I'm not even commanded to criticize. Okay? I, but I am commanded to pray. And I have to correct my... Oh, hey, I'm, I'm, the, I'm, I'm the greatest offender of all this. I'm not, I'm not saying these things maliciously. All right? We're, we, we, it's, it's easy to complain. You know when you know when you stop complaining, take a mission trip. Go to a third world country. Now America, perhaps, I believe, is becoming a third world country. Go to the jungles of the Philippines. Go to the the the, the rancheros of, of of Mexico. I mean, deep, deep, deep into Mexico. Go outside of America, and when you come back you'll kiss the ground. You'll kiss the ground. 
I remember when I first came here, I worked in trucking. I, was, I delivered furniture for about a year and a half before I went into management. And uh, I can remember going into neighborhoods in Brooklyn, Brownsville. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Midwest kid. I was only 25 years old, okay? And I can remember I, I was a helper. And the driver and I, they'd, they'd give us deliveries in Brownsville. Never forget this one delivery. The building was burned out. And somebody's getting new furniture. And I got to go up and I've got to verify the delivery. And I get to about this, the third level of stairs and the building's burned out. It was ghetto. And the biggest old German shepherd met me at the top of that thing. And thank God his chain was only so long. All right. But I say that to say this. You know what I wanted to do when I came back over the Verrazano Bridge? I wanted Carl my, my stickle. He was, he was my partner. He was the driver. Vietnam vet. We got along really well. He was six foot five and I'm five foot seven. All right. It was, the, it was the veritable odd couple. <laughs> I wanted, many times I wanted to say, listen, brother, just pull the, pull, pull the truck over and let me get out. I want to kiss, I want to kiss the highway. Because you had just, you had just walked into a third world neighborhood. It was burned out, man. It was ghetto at that time. So the greatest thing, get outside of your neighborhood. Get outside of your comfort zone and realize, you know what, as bad as what we probably are in America today, and I'm not making this a wonderful country anymore, because it's not. But when you start, you get outside of the boundaries of America, you'll come back here and be thankful, all right? We still have it. The poorest of us in America live above a lot of, a lot of the rest of the world. So, yes, it's like... I don't know what to do with, I don't, you know, but I'm not in charge of anything. How do you stop something? But I'm commanded to pray. I'm not commanded to criticize, complain. That's easy. That's the easy part. All right. Okay, enough of that stuff. What else? Brother. Amen. All right. So both of those were Kathleen? Yeah, Kathleen. And then Megan? Yeah. Okay. Uh, our brother in Dubai. Keep him in prayer. All right. We had... Uh, I, didn't, I didn't realize he was here. I took my mic off, and I turned around, and I, this guy is staring at me. Nathan Rue was here last Sunday. Yeah. We helped him get a, a vehicle, a Jeep. He wanted a Jeep. And, uh, you know, once he had said, you know how you have, when you haven't seen somebody for a while, it's like, you, and uh, somebody grows a beard and it's like, well, man, that's, you know, I, I couldn't even recognize you. But he, uh, he shook my hand and then I realized who he was, who, who, who he was. So I, my mic was on the shelf already, and I literally, I took time, and I told him, listen, brother, we're, we're really glad you're here. So he is, he's uh, wanting to be here every Sunday. They're giving him kind of a leave of absence. He's got his Jeep. We helped him get a vehicle, and he was, he was sitting right uh, on that last row in front of the sound room. So keep Nathan Rue in prayer. He's... Uh, by the grace of God, uh, you talk about a life that's being redeemed from destruction. 
Keep Nathan Rue in prayer. All right, what else? What else? Eddie? Yes. Say it again, brother. Yes. Yes, health and the stability of, of work. All right, what else? Anything else? All right, let's go to prayer. Uh, it's good to see uh, people back from camp, all right? Uh, the Rosados, good to have them back. What else? Who's pointing to who? Yes, sir. Say it again. I'm sorry. Uh, can we pray for everyone in Scotland to come home safely? Yes. Um, that, yes. All right. Yeah, we've got uh, a good portion of the team coming back Friday. And as I've already said, uh, and I think uh, uh, Aaron is flying uh, probably himself to Indiana. But uh, Pastor and Margaret will come home uh, several days later. They're staying there an, an, an extra week. And the unspoken. All right. What else? Yes, bro. September camp next week? Yes, I think I've already mentioned that. But September camp is, uh, I forget the dates exactly, but uh, that's a... Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Uh, 22nd to the 25th. There you go. Thank you, dear brother. September camp. That has used to be October camp. Now it's September camp. Okay. Brother. The nursing home ministry, please. Yes. Uh, our nursing home ministries... Uh, we've got another one. Golden Gate, I think, is supposed to start this the, of this month. Yeah. Yes. Golden Gate is supposed to start. Now, some of these, we've been in these nursing homes, assisted livings, uh, previously. But because of COVID, they shut the places down. And for two years, we haven't been a... Now it's started again, and uh, we're getting a good response uh, from the one that we're in, and now Golden Gate uh, is also opening up to us. Okay, I saw another hand. Brother? Yeah, I'd like for people to keep a young man named Max in their prayer. Uh, you know, he's living in a homeless shelter, and uh, I'd like you to pray that he, you know, get better housing. Mm -hmm. All right. Max. Okay, very good. All right, what else? Anything else tonight? Brother? The church would just ultimately grow. Our church? <laughs> yeah. Good. <laughs> That's... That's our goal around here. Our goal is for all of us, and I include myself in all of us, to continue to grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's, that was, if you're, if you're following Pastor Mike's messages on the prayers of Paul, uh, that was a big part of his, his prayers, to grow in the, in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. All right. Now, that knowledge, by the way, is not so you can win an argument with another Christian Amen. or show off uh, how much you know of the Bible. The more you, knowledge you get, the more compassion you should have. Amen. The more kindness I should have. Okay. If I'm growing in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, I'm being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. And I don't care whether he was 5'9 or 175. That's not what that means, okay? It's his character. It's his character. 
to be conformed to the image. That's how you grow. That's, that's growing in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Yes, that's a wonderful prayer, brother. Wonderful thing. I saw another hand somewhere. Brother? Yeah, I can't remember how to spell his name correctly, but uh, pray for a Spanish man or a Mexican man, him and his whole family. I was able to witness to them at the train station a couple weeks ago during uh, street industry. And um, he actually couldn't speak any English, so I ended up speaking to him in Spanish. But uh, just pray for him and his family for salvation. I definitely know that he's lost. And uh, his name is Asigo, A-C-I-L-L-O, I assume. Okay, very good. Mexican, it was the whole family you met, brother? Yes. Very yes, good. whole family was there. They, they actually came on the train with me, so I witnessed them the whole time because I took the train home. So, okay. yeah, that was great. They just prayed for their salvation. Good, very good. All right, Mexican family. All right, what else? Anything else? All right, let's uh, gather ourselves, two, three at the most, and, and I've got Kevin uh, Kogan is going to preach tonight. So, Kevin, if you just keep an eye when we're done praying, hope it's all yours, brother.
Testing. Okay, perfect. One, two, three. Repeat after me. No, I'm kidding. Amen. Good to be saved. Amen. Amen. What a what a blessing to be here tonight. Thank you, church family, Pastor Pat, for having me speak. And I wanted to bring a just kind of like a study tonight. It's more like a yeah, it's half and it's, it's like a study. But it's an interesting thought to me. I, I've been thinking about this for a, a long time. And it's a message on the family. Amen. And by the fact, I was praying with Eddie before, and he was talking about the family, the family. And uh, the family is, uh, well, Staten Island's big with the families. Amen. Mm-hmm. Brother Profeta would always say, Brother Chris would always say, the Guinea gangplank. The families move from Brooklyn, they move over the Guinea gangplank, and here they are in Long Island, uh, Staten Island. So it's funny. Inside joke, but... If you turn in your Bibles tonight over to the book of Mark, uh, the book of Mark, chapter 6, Father, I thank you for this time to preach and this time together, and I ask you, Lord, to hide me behind the cross and that you would receive all the honor and glory tonight. Thank you for your word. Thank you for giving us a book with no mistakes. Lord, you're so good to us. So, Lord, help us to, uh, Lord, uh, help me to be able to relay the information, the, the message, and all that's said and done. We pray it would honor you tonight. We'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The family. Mark chapter 6, let's pick it up in verse 1. Uh, we'll go to verse 6. We'll take a break, and then I'll continue to go on with other verses that are corresponding. But just to give you an overview before we begin reading, this, this is about the Lord Jesus Christ's own family that he was birthed into, right? There's four, there's four brothers and there's two sisters, and he's the, so there's seven, including himself. So he himself is part of a family when he comes. Amen. So this, this section of scripture gives a, little bit, it gives a little idea of what really was transpiring in the very early stages. My Bible tells me 31 AD, so it's really the beginning of the Lord's ministry. And the opposition that he gets from his family, it's pretty uh, ironic, I would, might, might add. Amen? Yeah, you would think Mary uh, understood from Simeon's prophecy in Luke chapter 2 that the Lord Jesus Christ... Um, Simeon's prophecy was to Mary that, you know, now I can rest. Salvation has been given to Israel. And then he says, P.S., a sword shall pierce thine own soul also. We'll read about that a little bit later. But here he is, and now he's full, full grown. He's 30. He's ready for his ministry. He's beginning. And Mark 6, verse 1, let's start there. And he went out from thence and came into his own country, and his disciples follow him. And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence hath this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him, that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph, excuse me, uh, and of Judah and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country and among his own kin and in his own house. And he could do there no mighty works, save that he laid his hand, his hands upon a few sick folk and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went round about the villages teaching. Then verse 4 says that a prophet is not without honor, but in his own country and among his own kin and in his own house. Uh, his, brother, his brethren didn't believe in him. They didn't believe the prophecy uh, at this stage of the game. He's just a man with a lot of words. Yes, he has a clean life. They can't point to one sin in his life, but they still don't think he, he is who he says he really is. Unbelief in his own house. Family sometimes is great opposition. We'll, we'll read about more of that in a little bit, but... Um, his brethren didn't believe. Look at look in Psalm 69, if you would. Just turn back there. Take a look. Now, David is writing Psalm 69. 
but it has an application to Jesus Christ. 69, let's pick up verse 8. It says, I am become a stranger unto my brethren and an alien unto my mother's children. Now, it's David's writing those words because if, if anybody was a stranger and if anybody was an alien, it was David in his own house. <laughs> he was the youngest out of all his brothers and sisters. He was chosen to be the king, so there was a lot of animosity that his older brothers were passed over. And so David writes this knowing that he's an alien, he's an outcast. As a matter of fact, he's not even in with the, when the, the time that Samuel goes to anoint David, he's not even in the house. He's an outsider. He's out in the field. He's praising his harp. He's singing songs to God. He's busy protecting the sir. He's busy protecting the sheep. He's, he's a shepherd. He's busy protecting the sheep. And he's so zealous about what his occupation is. He doesn't have time to hang out with his family members. He's the young, but he's out protecting. He's doing something. He's protecting the sheep. Matter of fact, he kills a lion and a bear. Who does that? <laughs> I can guarantee nobody in this room is going to take on a lion or a bear. David did. So he's an outsider. He's an alien. Christ is an alien. Can you imagine being a fly on the wall in the days living in Jesus' house? And he's by himself. He's reading the Torah. He's familiarizing himself. And he has to read the Bible because he is the Word of God. But he has to go through all the protocol of learning to become the Word of God. So he has to learn everything. That's how he can stifle the Pharisees when he's 12. But at this stage of the game, he stands out in his family. His family doesn't believe in him. He's a stranger. He's an alien. Amen? Uh, look in 1 Samuel. Take a look with me if you would. Go back, make a left, and take a look in 1 Samuel. Chapter 17. This is when David shows up. This is after Samuel pours the vial of oil on his head. I don't, know much, I don't know how much longer. Might have been that same year. Might have been a little bit longer. But the dad tells him to bring this food, these, these, this wheelbarrow of cheeses to your brother for the, for the war. At the time, Goliath is touting himself and challenging Israel for 40 days. And David happens to go down and you see, see witnesses of Goliath. But the, here's... The brethren, here's, the, here's, his old, here's his family members. And again, I want to bring this back to the family, okay? Here's the family that David is born into. Look in verse 28, 1 Samuel 17, 28. And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men, David is saying, who's going to go up against this guy? He's blaspheming God. Who's, who's going to go for him? He doesn't understand why nobody's taking, you know, taking, take, you know, getting, wanting to take him out. David's saying, how come he's doing this? How come he's doing that? And Eliab, the oldest brother, gets angry at David. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, why came his thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. And David said, what have I now done? Is there not... A cause. Yeah, yeah, there is a cause. But David has to explain himself because Eliab, his brother, is jealous. At this stage of the game, Eliab, he had to sit, his, his, all his brethren had to sit in a corner and watch Jesse anoint David. How do you think Eliab felt about that? He was over, passed over. So you have that, you see, this, you see this dynamic that's going on in the family of David. That's why he writes that in Psalms. So Christ shows up. In Mark chapter 6, and he has, so David is always likened to a type of Christ. Outside of, the, outside of Joseph, David is the greatest type of Christ in the Bible. So, you know, family, <laughs> families, it's a strange thing. When you, when you grow up in your family amongst brothers and sisters, I have three, <laughs> and you get saved and born again, that the very people you were closest with your whole life are now your enemies. You know, you were playing in the sand puddles with the kids. I put, when I was a little kid, I played with the with the, with the, the there was the big gym doll, and then there was Tonka trucks, and then there was Matt, you know there was toy. I remember playing, but then there was different. We had the pool game. I remember when I was a boy playing with my brothers and playing with my older sister, and then you get saved, and then it's like they never knew you. 
Just imagine how the Lord Jesus Christ felt. Back to Mount, back to Mark six. Unbelief in the family. Look at if you would uh, take uh, go, go first to Matthew, chapter ten. And this dynamic continues. Again, we're talking about the Lord Jesus Christ's family tonight. Matthew chapter ten, verse thirty-four. Again, my King James Bible says 31 A.D., so this is really relative to the time. They're all corresponding with each other, Mark, Matthew, and then John 7, which we'll go to next. So here in Matthew 10, 34, think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come, come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foe shall be they of his own household. Now, I'm going to say something to you. It's not politically correct. Forgive me. It's not arrogant, and it's not vulgar, and it's nothing like that. Italians and are Jewish, and there's certain proclivities that certain peoples have with families. Okay? Not a bad thing. But there's certain things that, are, that, that families hinder the work of God because of control. And the Lord Jesus Christ talks about, you know, if you're going to do something for me, it's about priority. We heard that Sunday, Sunday Brother Eddie preached about that a little bit. Prioritize. The Lord's not about against your family. He wants the priority. Remember what he said, the Lord suffered me first to go bury my father. He said, let the dead bury the dead. Did he really mean that? No, he meant the priority. The priority. You see, when you get saved, you are born into a new family. You're of one family and you're transitioned to another family. You're born into God. You're born into the kingdom of God. That first family does not take precedence. Your new family takes the precedence. Your new family is Christ. This church is your family. And it should be the most important thing in your entire life. Your brothers and sisters are more important than your own family. That does, that's not popular. Uncle Ralph, you can't make his birthday. This is the third year. Dad, I have to go to, I have to, go to church. You're always in church. You can't just this one time. No, Dad. The priority. The other family, right? That's what the Lord is talking about here. And that's what the family is right now. Your family is your greatest enemy, some of you, in here tonight. You're wrestling. Your biggest obstacle is your family. It's holding you back from serving the Lord Jesus Christ. He says the, man, he says, the man's foes are they of his own household. When I got saved, 1991, in Brooklyn, Bay Ridge, dad and stepmother June, and I was excited about the things of God, dad came down, dad understood, he was tolerant, he was patient, and then I started to witness at the table, and my stepmother, because she was married to a former gangster, and he died, picked up her chair, and I was sitting right here, and she did this. Slammed that chair down and put her back to me. And we never really spoke after that. Three years later, she got into a car accident and broke every bone in her body. Sometimes you have to be used by the Lord to try to help get rid the family into the other family. You know what your family is? Your family is here. And if you're going to go on for God and on for the Lord Jesus Christ, this is where, this is where it's going to come, right here. Not your natural family. Amen. Not your natural family. Italian folks, brothers and sisters in here, my best friends in here are Italian. I love you. you know, don't, let, don't, don't, don't take this the wrong way. See, the Lord is very, he's very deliberate and what he had, can you imagine? And, and, and the Lord just, growing up 30 years and seeing all the customs and all the Saturday Shabbos dinners and all the relatives and everybody over. And he was, you know, he was, he was, 
he wasn't, he was, the, the scripture doesn't really say, but he's an alien. He's an alien in his house. He's an outsider. The, the aliens, when we talk about aliens in America, those are the ones that are coming over the border right now in hordes, right? They're coming over. They're not from this country. So in his own house, he was a pariah. He was an outsider. So we see this evolution going on in his family. Amen? Now, you know, I, I, I think it's strange, and, I, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I'm always going to think that it's strange. But what, Why? Because coming to Jesus Christ is the most, most important thing you could ever do in your life. And you would expect, you would expect your family to be really excited for you and say, wow. But it's the opposite. It's the opposite. <laughs> it's exactly what the Lord says. It's a sword. It's father against mother. It's, we're father against son and mother against daughter and the in-laws. I have four sister-in-laws. Oh, my goodness. Ugh. They're starting up again. Pray for us. It's bad. It's, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I make light of it, but it's getting very bad because one of the sisters is near death, and we won't get into it. But they're not saved, and they're getting worse and worse, and worse, and worse, and the demon, and the, and the, crazy, it's unbelievable, you see that, you see the difference, you see the first family, and you see the new family, it's unbelievable, unbelievable, so, you know, you know, coming to Jesus Christ, so, you know, they don't understand that, you know, church is Monday, church is Sunday, right, your priority now is to forsake the world, yeah, it's, that includes, you know, you know, Sunday instead of the NFL. That includes street. That includes preaching on Wednesday night instead of bingo, right? Street preaching on Tuesday night instead of Netflix. Operation Jerusalem on Saturday instead of going to the mall. Reading and praying instead of being on your phone. Some some of y'all on your phone twelve hours a day. So oh, I'm preaching. I'm not trying to hurt you. But that either the distraction is going to, you're going to be distracted or you're going to put that thing down, turn it off, and get back into the book and get it back into prayer. Your life will change, I guarantee it. But it won't change texting and reading and being on social media for 10, 12 hours a day, which some of you are on. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> our Lord Jesus Christ, what did he, he set the precedent about family. God gave us our family. God instituted the family. God gave us a father. God gave us a mother. God gave us, you know, brothers and sisters, the Lord himself. God instituted the family. But he had another institution that he came when he, when he died and when he rose again called the New Covenant. And it was about the kingdom of God, which you're born into when you get saved and become a new creature in Christ. Old things pass away. Amen. Behold, all things become new. John, look in John chapter 7 as we continue here. John chapter 7. And verses 1 to 5. So... We're a year removed, and we're in the second year. We're in 32 A.D., so another year has gone by. In John chapter 7, verse 1, After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Jewry, because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. His brethren, here it is, therefore said unto him, Depart hence and go into Judea, that they, thy disciples may also see the works that thou doest, for there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. They tell him to go get killed. They're, They're seeking his death in verse 1, and they tell him to go there. I mean, that's the extent of family. Uh-oh. <laughs> Thank you. That's the extent of family. I'll just try to hold there. That's what unbelief will do. That's unbelief. After a while, the preaching and, this, and, the, and the teaching to unbelieving ears, they either do this, they walk away, or they rebel. And it was at this stage of the game that they were rebelling. 
Well, notice the opposition in this verse. The Bible says in verse 5, for neither did his brethren believe in him. Now, we read in Mark that they were offended at him, but here every word has meaning. See, in Mark 6, they were offended at him, but here in John 7, they're offended in him. What do you mean? Well, his claim to being the Messiah. They were offended at him proclaiming. It doesn't say that, but they're in him. What's in him? We're in Christ, you and I. We're in Christ. We're part of his hand. We're not in his hand. We're part of his hand, his body. See? <clears throat> so we know, notice that the opposition here gets worse and worse. And they hide their rationale in verse 4. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world. Look at one more example, and we're going to go on. Look at Mark chapter 3. The Lord Jesus Christ now <clears throat> is doing his ministry work. And sure enough, here comes mom and brothers, brothers and sisters. And they're trying to interrupt him because he's having this dialogue with the Pharisees. And he's scathing them. And he's, they, they can't answer him. And if you ask me that they were giving the family some heat because of your son, he's gone mad of his, what he's saying. And so the family tries to come in here and do an intervention. So let's, take, let's pick it up in verse 31. There came then his brethren and his mother, and standing without, sent unto him, calling him. You're interrupting. That's like somebody in here, like a street preacher, and you're coming, hey, brother, come here. I'm going to tell you He's He's preaching the word of God, and you're trying to get him away from what God's trying to do. See? They're trying to corral him away and try to control him and try to hijack him out. And the Lord doesn't have any part of that. Look what he says. And then the multitude sat about him, and they said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren without seek for thee. And he answered them, saying, Who is my mother? Who is my mother? This is what the family is to him. You see this? You see this mindset? This has to be in our mindset. This has to be how we think. This has to be how we act. This has to be us. Who is my mother? Who is my brethren? And he looked round about on them which sat about him, and said, Behold my mother and my brethren, for whosoever shall do the will of God, the same as my brother and my sister and mother. Amen. See, the Christ is speaking about another family while he prioritizes his mission here. He wasn't denying that Mary was his mother, was, wasn't denying that his brother and his mother were there. He wasn't denying that. What he was doing was prioritizing his mission. Over the family. The scriptures move on now. They move on from 31. They move on to 32. And eventually we get to 33 AD. We see a big shift. A very big shift that happens. And if you ask me what it was, it was the character and testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. His spotless reputation, his undying love. He loved his family. He loved his family. But he wasn't going to let that stop him from his mission. Amen? We shouldn't let that stop us from our mission, right? The family. So we see things going on. We see gets, Jesus gets condemned, he's given a death sentence, and now. The unbelief in the family starts to change a little. We see Christ in Pilate's judgment hall. He's bloody. He's from head to toe. He's not opening his mouth. Just then, Mary remembers an old man in Luke chapter 2, Simeon by name, telling her that this moment in Luke 2.35, Yea, a sword shall pierce through thine own soul also. She remembers this while she sees her son. Bloody. She was there. She's at the cross. She's in the upper room. She's in the, she's, she's in the judgment hall. She's right by his side. 
the whole time. I don't know about the brothers and sisters, but I do know that it was Mary. And I'm not trying to be Catholic here, okay? I'm trying to give, show you belief. And the kids are looking to the mother because back then in ancient Israel, the matriarch was very important in the family. Amen? Very important. Matter of fact, when you go to the list of kings in 1 Kings, it talks about the mothers, who was of this and who was of that, and it gives the list of the mothers just to show you how important the mother is in the king family and in each generation. So Mary plays, plays a pivotal role to her children getting saved. And I'm going to show you that in a minute. Mary remembers the words 33 years earlier, as if it was yesterday. She begins reading Isaiah 53. Uh, she sees her son firsthand, and so do the children. They see, that, as I was saying, they see him suffering. They see his countenance. They see his testimony. They don't see him railing for railing. He's getting whipped, and he's not opening his mouth. They see him getting smacked. He says nothing. And that, they see that. And they shake their head. And then James, well, the Lord's brother, remember him, he's an unbeliever. He doesn't still, he's still an unbelief. He's part of the, he's part of the brothers and sisters that told, told Christ to go up and die, go up to Judea where they seek to kill you. Well, things are starting to change now. It's later on. They see the Lord, you know, who's watching, every, he, who's watching everything and he's been studying the Lord's behavior. I mean, he grew up with him. He saw how he was. He watched him. It's the brother James, the Lord's brother. Now, he went back. It's my contention that he went back and he did some reading on his own. If you're not so sure, can, what's the best thing to do is consult the scriptures. He says, you know, they're beating him, they're, they're hitting him. The words that he says, he says that his words are like parables, and he speaks these parables, and it's all in Isaiah here. And he's brought as a lamb before the shearers, and he opened not his mouth, and he's not opening his mouth. And now, is this going on in the background? Well, something's going on in the background because you see a dynamic from the family to a family here that sees their brother being brutalized and a mother's son being tortured. And now you're starting to see the heart. Simeon said that the thoughts of the hearts might be revealed. Luke chapter 2. Those thoughts and those hearts are what are being revealed in that family. There's a change going on in that family. They went from unbelief. And as the couple of years progress, the preaching, they've heard the preaching, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the what? The word. the word of God. It goes back to the basics. They heard, no man spake. The soldiers came back to Herod and said, no man spake like this, man. Oh, the brothers and the mother are hearing the same words because they're attending. Something's transitioning. Sometimes it takes a little time for people to come around. It, I've never been a fan of this, you know, repeat a prayer after me. I hate that. But don't do, by the way, don't do, don't do that around me. You're going to get me very annoyed. Okay? That's not what Christianity is. Repeat after me, one, two, three. That's not salvation. Okay? Speak the word. Give them a track. Give them a hug. Let them know we're here. They have the address in the back. And say, we'd love to see you. And you know what? They might walk through that door and they might come in here and get saved. Amen? Amen? That's how it's done. But there's no difference than how this family started to now believe in their brother. Very interesting. The evolution of this whole family. They go from one family to another family. We see at the end of John, look at the book of John. So the crucifixion happens. Jesus dies. Mary's there. We don't read about the brethren being there. It doesn't say anything. It doesn't say that. But we read in John 19, verse 26. And this is why I don't think they were there. I don't know if they... I, I think it was too much for them. I'm giving them... I, I think the mother was there because she knew she had to be there. 
but I don't. I think it was too much for the brethren to be there at this stage of the game, 33 A.D. They're just about on board. Verse 26: When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple standing by, whom he loved, that's John. He saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciple took her unto his own home. Can you imagine the brothers and the sisters? Mary's children got her taken away and put into another man's house. That, that, that's unheard of before. That's not wasn't supposed to happen. You know what that was? That was, that was a direct... It wasn't necessarily a, a, a slap or insult by the Lord, but she was put into, what's John a type of? He's a type of the church. She was taken, the Lord told her to go home with John because she was part now of a new family. Your family right now, they might be holding you back. Your priority is your new family in Jesus Christ. James does a miraculous turnaround, the Lord's brother. Does a miraculous turnaround. It's that part. It's, it's, but that was, that was the straw that broke, if you ask me. And I am being a little bit, perhaps thinking a little bit ahead of the curve here. But that event right there. The mother was taken, the brother dies, and the mother is taken out of the family. And they were very close. And we see all through scripture that they're all together. And now she's now living with an apostle, not at her own house. That was the straw, if you ask me. Because now, the Lord, James, the Lord's brother, does a dramatic 180. And I mean a dramatic 180. And I wanted to preach this message like James, you know, the Lord's brother, but it's really about the family because that's how it reads. <clears throat> Look in Acts 1.14. We're in the upper room. Let's well, start in 13. And, and they were come in. They went up into an upper room where abode both Peter, James, John, and Andrew Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon Zelotes, and Judas, the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. Finally, there they are. Why? Because mom got taken away, and we'd like to be with her. She's our mother. And they had to realize and come to a decision, if I'm going to be with the mother, then this is the new family that we have to be a part of. You'll notice the brethren are there, all of them. You talk about conversion. The household is now believing. Amen? And what becomes a James? Look in 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter 15. Because James is here in the upper room now. It's 33 AD. He sees his brother crucified. He sees him coming up from the dead. And guess what he gets? He gets a visit. He gets a visit. He gets a post-resurrection visitation. Looking for verse 7, 1 Corinthians 15, 7. Uh, Take it back up to five. And that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present. But some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. His brother gets a visit. You ever notice that the, the visitation, the Lord appears to those that were always in unbelief? Paul, in Acts chapter 9, gets knocked off his horse and visited by the Lord, right? I mean, let me see here what I have. I have a bunch of notes here. We have Paul, we have Thomas, 
over there in, in John chapter 20, verse 26. Look at John 20, verse 26. Now, the Lord had already appeared to the uh, disciples in the upper room, but eight days goes by, and Thomas wasn't there initially. Now Thomas is here. But what's Thomas famous for? Doubting Thomas. Unless I see the print of nails in his hands and the, and the wound in his side, I will not believe. Well, the Lord says, okay. John verse 20, verse 26. And after eight days, again, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. Amen? And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. And of course the Lord goes on and says, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, right? Thou hast believed, blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. That's you. That's me. Right? We don't have to put our hands on his side. It wouldn't do us any good. We don't have to. We know his hand. We know the wounds that he suffered for us. Amen. And then there's, he appears to Peter in the end of the book of John. And what does he say to Peter? He asks him three times. What happened? Peter fell into unbelief. He fell into his own way. And the Lord asked him three times, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Feed my lambs. Simon, the son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Feed my sheep. And then he says it the third time because he denied him three times. So he always appears to those that are in unbelief. And so who's, who's in that family of unbelief? It's James. And then we see in Acts, 19 years later, Acts chapter 15. The question is about the Gentiles being saved. James is now the head of the church at Jerusalem. Isn't that interesting? You mean James, the Lord's brother? Amen. Nineteen years goes by and he's, he grows. Brother Frank prayed about that this morning. He asked the church to grow. You know what happened? James grew. And he grew and he grew and he grew. And the Lord's brother is now in charge of the church in Jerusalem. How about that? How about that transformation from one family to another? How about that miracle of evolution, right? We, we say evolution as far as evolving, how it went. In Acts chapter 15, let's pick it up, verse 13. And after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. What's the first thing that he says? Simeon. Where did he hear that before? Simeon, he, James wasn't born when Simeon, Simeon died before James was born, so he had to have heard him. He never met Simeon. That things are not written about Simeon in the Old Testament. So how did he know about Simeon? His mother. These are things going on behind the scenes. Simeon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take them out of a people for his name, and to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written. After this I will return and build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up. That the residue of men might seek after the Lord, and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things, known unto God or all his works from the beginning of the world. Wherefore my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. From James is the head of the church of Jerusalem, an unbeliever in his family 20-some-odd years earlier. Here he is now in his late 40s, early 50s, and he's on fire for God because you know what he did? The word of God, he saw something and he heard something. Faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God, I'm here to tell you that unbelief in the family is going to be a very big obstacle. And you can't let that stop you from serving Jesus Christ because you're, the truth is you have a family that's here. 
You have a family that's here in closing that's able to meet those demands and able to meet those, those emotions, amen, that your regular family doesn't understand. You, you, you ever wonder why they didn't understand? Because of fear. Because of fear. They don't understand the things that happened to you. They think it's a cult, some kind of thing, until they come here. How many parents have come here and gotten saved for children who have been saved first? Countless, tons. They come into those doors and they sit down and they hear the word of God and the defenses fall down and something happens in their heart. They get saved. Amen? They're birthed into a new family. Amen.